Thousands of artists have sold their babies in recent years, including the likes of Justin Bieber, Future, Bob Dylan, Sting, and Tina Turner. When I say babies, I don't mean the crying, annoying type. I mean the work of said artists, which is commonly referred to as their babies. We've seen an increase in the buying and selling of musical assets, from publishing rights to master recorded rights and everything in between. More funds have been raised to acquire music rights now than ever before, with the likes of Hypnosis, KKR, Round Hill Music, Sony Music, Universal, Carlisle, Shamrock and BMG all participating in this market. There's also other participants entering the market constantly and focused on a variety of niches. The larger size deals, such as Bob Dylan, Sting and Tina Turner, tend to get most of the headlines, but there are lots of smaller deals being done in the market as well. Not only that, there's been an increase in debt-focused firms lending against catalog and or leveraging the acquisitions of catalog. Now, all of this activity has resulted in artists rushing to sell their rights while the going is still good. But what exactly is being sold? There are primarily two things being sold, master recorded rights and publishing rights. Without boring you with the detail, master recorded rights can be looked at as the rights to an actual song when recorded and produced. In other words, rights to the finished product. Publishing rights can be looked at as the rights to the intellectual property or the idea of a body of work. Some artists may be selling their master recorded and publishing rights together or just one of the two. Premiums are usually associated with catalogues that offer the opportunity to buy all of an artist's rights, so both master recorded and publishing rights. When a firm or individual acquires these rights, they will then receive the royalty cash flows these assets generate into the future. So then, why would an artist sell their baby? Some artists rely solely on residual royalty income or touring income to fund their day-to-day -day living expenses. In the world we live in today, some don't even have the ability to tour. While some generate handsome amounts of royalty income annually, it may not be enough to fund more extravagant lifestyle expenses, such as buying a yacht and or a holiday home in the Caribbean. Some may also have aspirations of investing large sums of capital into other business ventures. What selling your catalogue does is provide you with a lump sum of cash to go and do other things. This could involve launching a business venture, buying lots of real estate, a private jet or an island. Or unfortunately for some, this could mean paying someone out because of a nasty divorce. Another reason why artists sell their babies is because they may want to pass the risk of cash flow obsolescence onto somebody else. Remember, there's no guarantee that a catalog will perform in the future as it's done in the past, and artists are aware of this. So by selling their catalog, the risk of cash flow obsolescence is passed onto the buyer. Another reason why some artists want to sell their catalogue is because at times it can be tax efficient. In short, you may pay less tax by selling your catalogue instead of paying tax annually on royalty income earned over a 15 year period, for example. The final reason why lots of artists were selling their babies is because we were in a really hot market with firms paying upwards of 20 times the average annual royalty income for catalogue. Because such large premiums were being paid, some artists who may have been on the fence about selling or were against the idea in its entirety then saw an opportunity to get a huge payday. Unsurprisingly, many cashed out because of this. Let's flip the script and discuss some reasons why investment firms might want to buy them. One reason is that it's a long-term value proposition that's uncorrelated to traditional asset classes like stocks and bonds. If there's a war, people listen to music. If there's a recession, people listen to music. And when times are good, people definitely still listen to music. Many of these musical assets have performed consistently over an extended period of time with peaks and troughs throughout their lives. However, for the most part, they've demonstrated a level of consistency going back five, 10, 15 plus years in some cases. Another reason why investment firms like buying music rights is because it's somewhat of an underexplored asset class. Investment firms are always looking for new ways to maximize their return on investment with ideas that could prove to be fruitful. So it's no surprise that music catalog acquisition is on their radar. Now, there's one school of thought, which is to buy the assets and hold the cash flows into the very long term with the view that you would be paid back in, let's say, 15 years, and then everything after will be considered upside. There's another school of thought where acquirers of catalog want to buy the rights of a certain artist cheaply and then sell the rights later on down the line at a profit. So a buy low, sell high strategy. Although parallels are being drawn to real estate, unlike real estate, there's very little opportunity to add value to catalog manually. That said, 
one could acquire multiple catalogues and sell them to another investor for a combined profit. There's also an opportunity for music companies which play in the catalogue acquisition market to manually add value. This could be done by re-releasing old material. Secondly, music companies could also get newer artists on their roster to sample catalogue works. So for example, if a company owns the works of Isaac Hayes, but also has Central C signed to the label, it could encourage Central C to sample some of Isaac Hayes' work with the view of boosting interest in the Isaac Hayes catalogue. Lastly, music companies could place catalogue music in film or TV. Now, all of this would hopefully boost the profile of a catalogue's music, generate more exposure and in turn, cash. If the plan is executed well, a firm could perhaps sell their catalogues later at a profit. So could fans get involved? Maybe. As a fan, you could acquire royalties from the royalty exchange. You may also know of a broker, lawyer, accountant or artist who may have made you privy to the sale of a catalogue. The process is pretty straightforward once understood. And to be honest, there's nothing stopping a fan from acquiring a catalog. For further information on this topic though, please watch my other video on how you can invest in music here. So what does the future hold? From the buyer's perspective, the short-term future looks bright. Capital continues to flow into the space, meaning there are more funds available to buy catalog now than ever before. The general level of financial sophistication in the market has grown and we've seen a financialization of the markets in that the approach to valuation is quite rigorous, the accounting and presentation of information, whilst at times frustrating, is more consistent. This is something that I envisage will only improve, thus increasing the efficiency with which deals can be done. From the seller's perspective, as there's more money chasing deals now than ever before, it's an opportune time for an artist to sell their catalogue. This would also suggest that investors ought to be ultra cautious when doing deals because overpaying is a real likelihood in a competitive market. Now, what would be interesting to know is what you guys think of artists selling their babies down in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching. If you like this video, then please check out my other videos on the music business here. Don't forget to please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.